Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for joining us today. We've come together to remark and reflect for the next several minutes upon the 10th anniversary of what we truly believe was an epical event, the first voyage of a revolutionary flying machine. We're honored today by the presence of a great many people who made that voyage possible, both on this stage here at the Johnson Space Center and in the auditorium arrayed before us and around the NASA centers via NASA Select Television. These people represent the management and operational chain that achieved the historic first flight of the space shuttle 10 years ago. Think about that for a moment. Ten years ago, recall, if you will, that STS-1 took place less than three months after Ronald Reagan was inaugurated as our 40th president, and only two weeks after he was gravely wounded by an assassin's bullet. As a matter of fact, the president's first full day back at the White House after the assassination attempt began at 6.50 a.m. Eastern Time in the family quarters of the White House, where he arose to watch the first launch of the space shuttle. Our world was beginning to change that year. 1981 was the year that Walter Cronkite signed off for the last time as the anchorman of CBS News. It was the year that Prince Charles and Diana were married. The year that Israel bombed a nuclear reactor in Baghdad. And the year that we first heard of a new Polish labor movement called Solidarity. 1981 was the year that we met Indiana Jones and Fernando Valenzuela, and the year that Sandra Day O'Connor became the first woman appointed to the highest court of the land. 1981 was the year the Washington Post had to hand back a Pulitzer Prize, and the year that Al Davis sued the NFL for the right to move the Raiders from Oakland to Los Angeles. It was a vintage year, all right. It was a year of the air traffic controller strike the year that Muammar Gaddafi trifled with the U.S. Navy and learned it doesn't recognize his claim of territorial rights to the Gulf of Sidra. 1981 was the year that Sony introduced the Walkman, and the year that Hepburn and Fonda gave us on Golden Pond. There are a good number of people in this room today, but the odds are that half of you were not at the Johnson Space Center on April 12, 1981, the day the Space Shuttle Columbia was launched because half of the people at the Johnson Space Center today were not members of the Johnson Space Center team in 1981. It was an eventful year. It was one that will stand out in the history books as the beginning of an era. And we're here today to talk about one of those events, the launch of the world's first true spaceship, the Space Shuttle. In 1981, John Yardley was the NASA Associate Administrator for Manned Spaceflight. He had been so since 1974, through the hard years. He interrupted a long and distinguished career at McDonnell Douglas to take over this oftentimes thankless position at the head of NASA's shuttle chain of command. He saw us through those turbulent, formative years with the OMB and Congress of ever-shrinking budgets, it seemed, schedule problems, and tile problems. He returned to McDonnell Douglas in 1981 as president of the Astronautics Division to cap a career that began with the company in 1946 and included leadership roles in the design and operations of Mercury, Gemini, and Skylab. Mr. John Yardley. Thanks, Al. Uh, Al said these are going to be short introductions, so we start when he started and run. And that was an awful long introduction. Where'd he go? <laughs> I sincerely am happy to be here on this 10th plus 3 anniversary of the first flight. Was it, was it today that they landed or yesterday? Yesterday, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I personally am uh, an advocate of the shuttle. Probably I'm a little too uh, close to it to not be. I believe it's the most magnificent flying machine ever created by uh, a man in this world. There may be other worlds that have better ones. And uh, I believe it's, it's been around 10 flying. It was, there was 10 years before that 
that was the gestation period. And I believe it'll be another 10 or 20 uh, before it loses its status as the number one NASA manned space carrier. It has uh, people pot shotting at it from time to time. Uh, it's not perfect. We did have an accident. We fixed that up. Uh, and I, I hope that we never have another, but we can't count on that. Recently, uh, uh, a good friend of mine and most of the people on the, on the uh, stage, Norm Augustine, headed a committee of people that made recommendations to NASA on what to do. I don't agree with all those recommendations. Uh, <clears throat> I think they missed a couple of things that were important, like, like uh, why man flight ought to be number one instead of science. Uh, they missed the fact that without man flight in, in strength, you're not going to have the motivation of our young people to become uh, uh, serious students of uh, engineering mechanics, uh, science, and uh, become astronauts and engineers. Uh, that, to me, is probably one of the most important things that we've contributed to our society. Well, I'm going to try to be a good headquarters type and not say much. I've not been noted for that in the past, but, <laughs> but what I would like to say to this group, I know a lot of you are involved on the shuttle, is keep it up. It's a great machine, and it will be for another 20 years. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Yardley. Chris Kraft was director of the Johnson Space Center from 1972 through 1982, in the conclusion of the Apollo program through Skylab, Apollo Soyuz, and the development and test flight of the Space Shuttle. Dr. Kraft began his career with NASA's predecessor, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics at Langley in 1945. His significant contribution in aeronautical flight research led to his appointment to the Space Task Group in 1958, and he became the nucleus of the manned, that group became the nucleus of the manned spacecraft center. As the original flight director for Mercury and Gemini, he developed the basic mission and flight control techniques that have been used throughout all U.S. manned space flights. Chris Kraft sir, currently serves as an aerospace consultant. He's on the board of directors of numerous corporations, including Park Plaza Hospital, LifeCell, and Panhandle Eastern, as well as Houston's Manned Space Flight Education Foundation. Chris Kraft. Good afternoon. Uh, I won't be as kind as John Yardley. John, I think uh, I'd like to agree with you about the shuttle. Uh, I certainly agree with you about the Augustine Group. As a matter of fact, I think most people in the manned space flight business would agree with you about the Augustine Report. The good thing about it, however, it's ambiguous as hell and you can do most anything you want to. <laughs> um, first, I'd like to say I'm glad that there are so many people interested these days in history. Uh, I find that uh, a lot of people in NASA seem to disdain history, particularly by those things that I read about the shuttle, about 40 flights a year, the fact that it gets a grade B, uh, that it, they're having a hell of a time flying it 10 times a year. And those thoughts seem to rub me the wrong way. Uh, I hope you all read Brian Welch's piece in the uh, Roundup. I think he did a superb job uh, writing about uh, the first flight of the shuttle, so I won't try to repeat the thoughts that he gave there. I would, we were asked to talk about uh, the, the first days and the leading up to the first flight, and there, are, when, you, when you ask somebody to do that, there are nothing but thoughts that race through your head. There were many skeptics. Uh, we had the criticism of a lot. Uh, we had the belief of many, but we only had the guts of a few. And it took uh, a lot of guts to go to the pad with that machine the first time. Uh, I don't want to imply that, that we didn't want to have the criticism that we had from the skeptics, because I think it did sharpen our wits. I think it made us think about all the things that uh, could go wrong and be prepared for those things that might and to, to assure ourselves that we were ready to fly. And I think we were ready to fly. It, 
frankly improved our confidence, I believe, to have that many people criticizing what we were doing. Uh, there were many comments made. Uh, I remember one comment that was made that will stick in my brain for the rest of my life at an AIAA meeting in uh, Baltimore, a very prominent man in aerospace accused me of being a murderer. He said that the tiles were all going to come off the machine. And I immediately went back to my hotel. I talked to Max Faget about it, and he tried to calm me down quite a bit. And I, but I wrote that down word for word, and you can be assured if I ever write a book that it will be there. There were others that wrote letters to us uh, that I remember from a very prominent aerospace gentleman that both Mr. Cohen and myself met uh, uh, several days after the flight. It was a long letter of, uh, about a month before the flight that one of the suggestions that he was, he was absolutely convinced that all the tiles were going to fall off the machine. And he suggested that we uh, secure the largest steel net that we could find and wrap it around the uh, vehicle so that the, when the spaceship came back from space, all the tiles would not fall off and embarrass the hell out of us. Uh, believe me, a very prominent gentleman in space flight, and I, that letter also appears in my memoirs. If you want to read those, you can go to Virginia Tech. Uh, the build-up to the launch was certainly exciting and, and a hectic process, and uh, Aaron will certainly remember that uh, at about T minus three days, we had a visit from both our own thermal people and the people from Rockwell that said that we must replace about 60 tiles on the eyebrow of the shuttle or they were all going to come off if we had a worst case flight. And believe me, we took them off and put them back on again because that's how sure we wanted to be. During launch and entry was certainly the uh, most... Uh, exciting parts of that flight. If you aren't excited during launch, even today, you don't understand the problem. Uh, but on the first flight, on the first flight when we had never flown that configuration before, I mean, everything we had flown in, fly, in space before was a tandem configuration, when, and uh, the one that McDonnell Douglas invented of having this thing stuck on the side was not very exciting to any of us. And we had run a lot of tests on that and done a lot of computations, but I don't believe that anybody would have given you a 100% probability that it was going to fly uh, well. I think that we would have come up with 99.9, .9, but when you still have that one-tenth, I know that Bob Thompson impressed me many times with the interaction of those dynamic oscillations and structure that we could have. And after it got into space, I was very relieved. The entry, certainly for the first time, any time a vehicle had, no vehicle had ever flown through that kind of a flight regime before. The thing I remember most is that I was absolutely certain that the gains would all have to be changed after we flew once. And after it landed, uh, I guarantee there wasn't a damn soul that was ever going to touch the gains again <laughs> because it flew so well. We did have some oscillations, if I recall, around um, in the la latter Mach number range between six and three, but uh, even so, it was a very, very beautiful thing. And the exhilaration at landing that I had, uh, to me, it was the most beautiful thing I have ever seen the day it landed. And uh, believe me, it, when it lands, it still is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Now. Uh, what, do, what do I think 10 years later, Mr. Cohen asked me? Well, certainly the Challenger accident still lingers in my soul. It was such an unnecessary thing. Uh, it was the result of human frailty. It had nothing to do with the machine. Certainly the rocket failed, but there were telltale signs there that it should have been fixed. And in my day, I have to say, we would have fixed it. There is where history comes to play. All of us sitting up here remember our discussions about escape systems, about taking the engines off, 
about reliability of the solid rocket, about the solid rocket being our escape system and that the reliability of that machine, that part of the machine, had to be one. And at any time you played with that part of it, it had to be sure that it was going to fly well. So somewhere along the line, history was forgotten. I'd like to give you some examples that also because this vehicle is sometimes criticized as not being as great as those that had flown before and didn't have the reliability of the Saturn V. In Mercury, if you will allow me a little history, the first time we flew it, we had leaking thrusters. And we all concluded that the system was freezing, that it was getting slush and causing the the uh, valves to, to fail open. So the next flight, we worked on that and did everything we could and decided that we would put some heaters on it and put, fortunately, we put some thermistors on it also. The damn thing wasn't getting cold, it was getting hot. And we had to then, after the next flight, put a shunt, a heat shunt on to keep the heat from, from the thrusters they were getting back in the lines and causing the valves to, to stay open and leak. I'd like to remind you of the Saturn V and something that we never had in the space shuttle called POGO. And we made sure that the SSME did not have POGO, but the first flight of the Saturn V had POGO. And the second flight of the Saturn V had POGO so badly that the S2 engine in the middle was deflecting a beam that is about this big, about 20 inches up and down. And the only reason it didn't come unglued like a $2 pair of shoes was the fact that the engine shut itself down. And yet the next flight on that machine, we sent three men to the moon because we fixed it. The S-4B did the same thing first time we used it, it shut down. So I want to remind you that there were plenty of problems in Apollo. There have been plenty of problems in the shuttle. But in my mind, the shuttle is the finest machine ever built. And it'll be a long time producing a machine of equivalent reliability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. Robert F. Thompson was the Space Shuttle Program Manager through those formative years, from 1970 through the entire R&D program, 1981. Bob Thompson joined the Langley Research Center of the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics in 1947, was assigned to the Space Task Group, which in 58 became the nucleus of manned space flight, along with Chris. He managed the Skylab program office responsible for design and development of the first U.S. space station and is currently vice president and general manager of McDonnell Douglas Space Station Division to Bob Thompson. Thank you, Hal. Uh, if you'll notice, I didn't bring any notes with me. When you follow John Yardley and Chris Kraft, you're endangered if you have notes. So you want to leave yourself a lot of flexibility to move about. <laughs> I'd like to first of all thank Aaron for getting this little party together. It was very thoughtful and I'd like to thank all of you for coming. And then uh, I certainly want to uh, extend my greetings to our colleagues from the other NASA centers, uh, particularly the Marshall and Kennedy centers because um, <clears throat> The shuttle is a very interesting machine. It has very significant phases. It's got a launch phase where lots of things are interacting, lots of centers are interacting, uh, lots of things can go wrong, lots of things can go right. Once you get on orbit, we kind of drop down to where one center is predominantly involved. Things can go wrong, but they tend to go wrong a little bit slower, and they can go right, but it's a little bit slower. And then you have to go through the entry and landing phase. So the shuttle was really a remarkable effort from the standpoint of getting different groups together around the country to take on 
key technology activities and then bring them all back into focus. So we could spend a lot of time this afternoon talking about Pogo or tiles falling off or computers not synchronizing or gains in flight controls uh, causing some <clears throat> reaction between the lateral and longitudinal modes because the pilot starts chasing the longitudinal mode and the lateral mode starts moving and he doesn't have enough uh, hydraulic gain to go chain that particular thing. So we could uh, probably have a good time, just a good uh, change control board round table here. Uh, I would like to, though, try to put the shuttle in a little bit broader perspective, uh, particularly with regards to what some of the things we're doing today are. Uh, from my perspective, the country has <clears throat> really made three basic decisions in manned spaceflight. It has made a fourth pronouncement that I would call rather than a decision. Let me try to get you on the same thought process with me. I think the first decision of manned spaceflight we made was in the 1957-58 time period where the country decided, particularly due to the stimulus of what was going on in other parts of the world, to enter the manned spaceflight picture. There was a lot of discussion about it at that time, but no real decision to get into it. But once Sputnik occurred, there was a basic decision to get into it and get into it fast. And that led us to the Mercury and Gemini programs. There was then a fairly monumental decision made, and it was made in a unique way, and that was a pronouncement, if you will, by the President of the United States that rapidly became a decision because it got the full support of the country to go to the moon and back and do it with people. And of course, that became the Apollo program. So that was a second major decision. <clears throat> then there was a very monumental decision that was made in the late 60s that we're still following. This decision was made in the 68, 69, 70 time period. And it was not a decision announced with a lot of fanfare. It was not a decision made by the president in front of the Congress. It was kind of a quiet decision. The country almost backed into it. And it was a decision made to not build any more of the Apollo kind of hardware. We had been to the moon and back uh, four times, I guess, or we were in the process of getting positioned to do that. It's pretty well felt that the Apollo hardware, as it was designed, had a certain limited application. And really, I think in the eyes of a lot of people, once the basic Apollo mission was fulfilled, there was really not a lot of drive on the part of the nation to continue to fly to and from the moon on any kind of a regular basis. So a decision was made quietly, almost backed into that in manned space flight, we'd number one, continue to have a manned space flight program, which is very important. And then number two, we would shift our energies back to low Earth orbit and try to build a capability of living and operating in low Earth orbit on sort of a semi-permanent basis. Now, there had been a lot of decisions, a lot of, not decisions, a lot of discussions of when and how we should maybe do things like space stations. Would it be large spinning masses launched by Nova class vehicles? What would the personnel carrier be that went back and forth? And so the decision that was really evolved in the late 60s was that we would build a shuttle type vehicle that could carry people and equipment. And the shuttle would have the ability with a crane on board to move masses around could take enough people, the people could go outside the vehicle and work, they could stay inside and work. And if you had that tool in your hand, once you got that tool in your hand, you could then think about building a modular space station because it could bring components up there and you could really take the country down a manned space flight path for 10, 15, 20, 30 years once you got this near-Earth or, near Earth orbit infrastructure in place. Now, there was a lot said at that time about using the shuttle for other things, and certainly it can do many other things. Uh, it can launch satellites. In fact, the mission that was just recently uh, completed was almost a picture-perfect mission of what the concept of the vehicle was when we started, as far as taking a satellite in orbit, doing certain things, and then turning that satellite loose. But that, that alone would not have justified the shuttle. 
The, the shuttle can launch satellites, but that would not be the reason for building it. If you just wanted to get a satellite to orbit, I don't think you'd build anything as comprehensive as the space shuttle. The space shuttle really gives the nation a lot of versatility. We're today now very actively designing and building <clears throat> the modular space station that in com combination with the shuttle will give the country an ability to do things for the next, say, 20 to 30 years. Who knows, it might be 40. Uh, I've noticed time tends to go somewhat faster a little later on in your life. So I'm hoping the next 40 years goes pretty fast here. If it doesn't go fast, I'm not sure, John, you or Chris, or some of us are going to be able to see the whole thing here. But I think the, the thing that you should recognize, uh, particularly when you read in the newspaper that the shuttle didn't achieve its expectations of 60 flights a year at $2 a pound delivery on orbit, I don't think anyone ever argued that that was the reason for building the space shuttle. Uh, as you conceive these systems, and you have to go through the dynamics of bringing centers together, or bringing congressional factions together, or bringing industry together, you need to have some fairly longer, longer term objectives. So the third major decision was a shuttle and near Earth orbital manned spaceflight objectives. Now I think the recent pronouncement by the president that the lunar follow-on activities and the planetary follow-on activities are out there somewhere is a very encouraging goal for the nation. But somewhere you have to get between those goals and the programs that lead to those goals in some pragmatic way that will get the Congress to fund the things on an annual basis and get the engineers and the designers in a position where they can build the machine. So I think we're on that path. <clears throat> I think the shuttle will we'll do its part of the activity, and um, <clears throat> the country needs to get itself in a position that even, even with another hiccup, a major hiccup like the Challenger, that we can keep the shuttle flying and can keep the evolution of manned space flight, because I think that's what the, the shuttle really is all about. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you for those thoughts, uh, Bob Thompson. Mr. Thompson had the responsibility of putting his arms around the entire space transportation system program, the, the boosters, the orbiter, the launch systems, and so on. Aaron Cohen, 10 years ago, and going well back to 1972, was responsible for managing the development of the space shuttle orbiter, that portion of the program that everyone recognizes today as being the a machine that looks like an airplane and flies like a space plane. Aaron was responsible for design, development, and production, as well as the test flights of the orbiter, flights STS-1 through 4. Came to NASA in 1962 after serving as a design and research engineer for RCA and General Dynamics. He worked here on Apollo guidance, navigation, and control systems, and in 1969 became manager of the Apollo Command and Service Modules. Today, Aaron Cohen is director of the Johnson Space Center, but he will address us today with his recollections of the Space Shuttle Development Program as he saw it in that period, 1972 through STS-1. Aaron? Thank you very much, Hal. I do have notes, Bob. Uh, I always, in this, uh, I used to brief these three gentlemen continually uh, through this period of uh, developing the Arbiter. I used to brief Bob and then Chris and then John and they used to be very, uh, very, very interesting briefings and discussions. I would like to be sure before I start as Bob uh, that uh, I pay my respects to the Kennedy Space Center and to the Marshall Space Flight Center uh, and, a, and a great team effort in putting the, uh, the uh, space shuttle together along with the Stennis Space Center. And I'd also like to recognize the contractors that I worked with during this period of time, primarily Rockland International uh, Space Division and, the, and IBM. Uh, there were many, and if, I, I just don't have time to mention all the myriad of subcontractors that we visited and talked to that played an extremely important part in putting this uh, fantastic uh, machine together. At the, uh, there was a ceremony in Washington uh, 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 Friday uh, 
commemorating the uh, 10th anniversary of STS-1. And uh, J.R. Thompson there uh, spoke as the role of the, uh, the deputy administrator, but uh, we also need to recognize that J.R. Thompson, not only as deputy administrator, was a very key manager in putting the uh, main engine together at that period of time. The person that's not with us today that really wanted to be here very much was the uh, uh, backup uh, uh, PLT, backup pilot to, uh, to uh, John's flight to STS-1 to Bob Crippen, who also couldn't be with us, but uh, Admiral Truly. We invited Admiral Truly as not as the NASA administrator, but as the uh, backup pilot to be with us. And he was coming up into the very last, but then something in Washington uh, kept him there was very important. So we do, uh, we are sorry that those two gentlemen aren't with us. And uh, we're sorry that the uh, backup PLT, the NASA administrator, couldn't join us today. Um, there were some interesting statistics that come out of the shuttle. Uh, if you, if you uh, talk to people, some were in, uh, in our roundup paper. Some were, were presented in Washington, but I think some that I would like to mention to you just to see what the shuttle has done in this uh, last uh, decade. Uh, since STS-1, the shuttle has put 1 million pounds of payload into orbit, and 60% 60, 60 of that is science. Uh, half the flights carried into orbit had some type of experiments in it, in the shuttle. We carried 122 astronauts into orbit. We've performed two-thirds of a work year in orbit. 40% of the world mass into orbit with 4% of the launches over the past decade. And if you consider the orbiter itself, we've put 10 million pounds into orbit. Two decades prior to the shuttle, prior to STS-1, the U.S. had 1,000 launches with a mass into orbit of only 7 million pounds. And shuttle did that in less than 10 years with 39 launches. So you see the shuttle did a mass in this, in this uh, decade, a fantastic amount of work. And you might say, as, and I'm, I'm quoting JR, it's really one of the really heavy lift launch vehicles if you look at the mass we, we put into orbit. And there are many people, as I said, are quick to criticize the shuttle program and NASA in general. But to those critics, let me say that STS-37, a flight that many of you worked on here, and it's a magnificent crew and ground support team represent the very best that, space that manned space flight has to offer. After a textbook countdown, the mission began on April 5th, and on day three, the deployment of the Gamma Ray Observatory ran into a snag. With a professionalism that you can't beat in our ground crew and our flight crew, they did an EVA, performed it, got the Gamma Ray Observatory operating, and saved a $600 million satellite. So you can see that uh, the shuttle does have a lot of flexibility, and that mission depicts what the shuttle is all about. From August uh, 1972 to uh, April of 1991, I was, uh, was a time for me of, uh, you might say, complete dedication in terms of designing, developing, problem solving, testing, and yes, budget deliberations to see if we could get the arbiter ready to go. Um, all of this, all of this, doing all of this was a goal of flying the shuttle for the first time on STS-1. Uh, we had major ground tests to go through. We had the ground vibration test to understand the pogo effects. We had the combined load test to understand our tile issues. We had the main propulsion test article to understand the engine and the interface with the engine. Structural tests we had to go through the flight control hydraulics laboratory to understand our hydraulic systems. The software development labs and the shuttle avionics integration labs to understand our avionics and our software and our hydraulic systems. And yes, we had, and I go back through this and each one stands out to me as a, as a memory. We had tests on tiles. Uh, I remember once uh, Kenny Kleinkinek, we had Kenny Kleinkinek down at the Cape putting tiles on 102 with Bob Overmeyer. We used to have a telecon with him every morning. And I was very anxious to get 102 completed. And I'd say, Kenny, how many tiles did we put on? He said, well, we didn't do too good today. I said, why not? Because we didn't take any on. I kept thinking the purpose was to put them on, not take them off. But he kept saying we didn't put any on because we didn't take any off. But, uh, but we had the tile problems to go through. We had APU, auxiliary power units tests. RCS testing, ohms testing, mechanical systems, thermal control, and you can go on and on. Each subsystem that our, our managers, our subsystem managers, and our flight controllers look at today, we had to go through the design, the testing, the certification, the acceptance testing of each one of those, and that all led to the approach and landing test and then to STS-1. 
You know, I try to think back and think of what, uh, what bothered me the most, and, it, it, uh, and I, if I listened to one of the programs that was on our local TV station, I, I watched myself the other night, and uh, one of our reporters asked me, uh, what was on your mind? I said, I was worried. And he said, what were you worried about? I said, everything. So I, I guess, and that's how it came across, I guess, in all honesty, I was worried about, about everything. But I'll tell you, the first problem that we ran into, which you might even not know about, uh, we were putting, say again? I say now, 10 years later, I'll tell us what the first problem was. Yeah, I'll tell you what the first problem was. The first problem, now I'm telling them, they didn't know. The first problem, we were putting the Ford fuselage together, and I got a call that we used soft rivets. I said, my goodness. I said, we've been using rivets for I don't know how. John, how long have we used rivets on airplane? And we had soft rivets. I said, why me? Why, on this high technology spacecraft, should we use something that's so mundane as soft rivets? But we had to go take all the rivets out and start over. So those are the type of things that, that, that get to you. And then we had a tile problem. All of a sudden, one day, we learned that the tiles wouldn't stay on the vehicle. And you would think, and at that time, we did think. We thought it was really the end. How are we going to put these 32,000 tiles on? When we, but it, it, leave it to the engineering ingenuity. We came up, somebody, and somebody I'll mention, his, I won't mention his name, but somebody here at JSC and at, at uh, Rockwell came up with densifying the tiles, which solved a problem that you would think could never have been solved. What I'm, the point I'm trying to make, it was ingenuity. It was people with dedication that were able to solve problems. And, Every step along the way, we thought, my gosh, something was not going to work. We were stumped. But engineering, either at the contractor or at NASA, either at the Johnson Space Center, under Na other NASA centers, came and solved the problems. We thought aerodynamics. We'd never solve our aerodynamic problems, our flight control system problems, as Chris talked about. Uh, we, but we were able to do that. And uh, so you can go on and on, and I could talk about each one of these for a long period of time because I get a little bit emotional when I look back on it. But we were able to solve each one of those problems and get up to STS-1. And when we got to STS-1, ready to fly, uh, you asked me, what was I thinking about? What was I thinking about when John and, and Crip got into the vehicle? And I guess I was worried about everything. But it turned out I really wasn't worried about everything exactly at that moment because I thought in all honesty, we did a very sound job. We did a very sound technical job. I guess when I think back, I, in, in a very honest fashion, I think maybe what worried me the most is maybe everybody was talking to me and telling me things and uh, saying this and that, and I just wondered, was I listening to everybody the way I should have been listening to it and reacting the way I should have been reacting to it? So um, you, you never know, and that's what was worrying me. Did I pay attention to everything I should be paying attention to? It turns out I did, or we, we all did, and it was a very successful flight and a very successful vehicle. I, uh, there are so many people to mention and talk about. Um, I remember sitting in the CCBs, our change control boards, with Gene Kranz, um, attentive, with Max Viget there and Bill Tyndall there, some of the people that aren't here today. Uh, I know Arnie Aldridge is going to be here later, who did a lot on the software. So there's so many people to pay respects to to get STS-1 off. But I think we uh, did do a good job. Uh, I think it is a fantastic job, and now, now you're going to really have the, the, the honor to hear from the, some of the people that, uh, that flew that vehicle for you. So thank you very much. We're going to give these gentlemen an opportunity to reminisce among themselves and with each other here in just a few moments, and later on perhaps we'll even entertain questions from those of you in the audience. So. If some of those have, some questions have occurred to you up to this time, we hope you won't be bashful about asking them. You've heard from the management team, those who had the ultimate responsibility for the budget, for the schedule, for the technical development, the engineering, and getting a space shuttle system built. But the space shuttle, after all, is a manned flying vehicle. It requires a crew. Somebody has to climb in the cockpit and go fly. Joe Engel has never strayed very far from a cockpit to this very day. Joe was the backup commander for STS-1, and he was the commander for the second flight of the space shuttle. That flight, by the way, uh, was followed by another, by Joe, by STS-51I, which deployed not one, not two, but count them, three satellites, and in the process, repaired one. He's a former X-15 pilot that joined NASA in 1966, and in 1982, 
was named Deputy Associate Administrator for Manned Space Flight at NASA Headquarters. He is currently Major General Joe Henry Engel, U.S. Air Force, the Air National Guard Assistant to the Commander-in-Chief of NORAD and the U.S. Space Command. Joe Engel. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I didn't come with any notes, but I made some here on these cards, so that's all the notes that I have. Uh, Aaron, thank you very much for inviting me. And Aaron, uh, if I understood you right, you, you said that uh, the poor old backup PLT, Richard truly agreed to put his backup PLT hat on today. And uh, I'll take your word for that, but boy, times have sure changed. I'll tell you, the backup crew damn well never did used to get invited to the White House for a briefing on it. <laughs> In fact, we never got invited to brief any of you guys, I don't think. It was always John and Crip. About the best invitation Richard and I got was up to George Abbey's office, and that was, that was generally to work up some kind of a chili cook-off crew or be in a St. Patrick's Day parade or something like that. It, speaking as a backup crew, I, I want you to know that uh, in Austin, it, was really, it was really tough following John and Crip. They were an outstanding crew. Um, I always wanted to be like John. I wanted to try to emulate John, but I, I, was, I couldn't do that because John, as you remember, John used to always walk around looking right at the floor. He'd walk around like that. And that was okay for John, but I had this bald spot up there that had a lot of vanity to go along with it, so I, it really didn't work at all. In fact, everybody had kind of Richard and Crip and everybody had a lot of hair, so I had to, had to bypass that part. And Crip, I remember, I wish Richard were here today, I wish Crip were here today, because Crip, I remember w one time uh, Richard and I, he came out to Edwards uh, to help us out while we were getting doing some flying out there, and, and we had to handcuff him to his T-38 one evening. We did it kind of as a joke. He got in there kind of late in the evening, but we, we forgot where the keys to the handcuffs were, and <laughs> we really did, and it took about an hour, an hour and a half to find the keys, and it was getting dark and everything, but everything has something good can come out of it. Crip got about an hour and a half of cockpit time, familiarization time there, but, <laughs> that T-38. I, I tell you, I can't think of a time when I was more proud to be able to be part of a program than on this program here, because I think partly the reason was that we realized, everyone who worked on, on uh, STS-1 realized that the whole world was watching us. And if you recall, that was a time when Made in America didn't really have the prestige that it's beginning to get back again. And, and we knew that this machine was going to have United States of America on the side of it. And I think that one of the, one of the neatest things about working on this program was that we realized that we all were putting on our T-shirts that said USA on it, and we were going to go out and show the whole world what we could do with technology and ingenuity and, and, and just flat desire to make something happen. Um, it, it wasn't all without concern. I mean, there, we really did. There were, there were some things we really did wonder if it would work, but we didn't ever worry about it. We never sat around and, and talked about, you know, is it going to work? We just knew we were going to make it work. Now, we did consider some things about how well it would work. Um, uh, Garth, Bob, and Aaron, and Chris have all alluded to the tile situation. Uh, there were other things, too. There was a worrying about what would happen if an engine or a couple engines failed during the launch phase, where would it come down? and. Uh, and the entry, the guidance, how well the guidance would be, whether it'd spit John Cripp out over Edwards or, or just where it would. The tile thing, uh, we had a, a, a deal worked out. John, you remember the tile repair kit, that gooey stuff that if a tile came out, we would go over and, and take a tile. There's a hole there, and you'd smear this stuff in this hole. And um, boy, am I glad we never had to really do that. I'm not sure. I'm sure it would have worked. It didn't smell worth a damn. And I'm not sure how some of those areas we would have gotten to to put the tile in. But the, and the engine thing, John, and John has very graciously given Richard and I a lot of, of, uh, uh, of credit to helping out on transatlantic abort. If an engine goes out going on across the Atlantic, too late to come back to Cape, going on across and landing over there, well, we really can't take much, we really had incentive and were motivated to, because John, they failed some engines on John in, in the simulator, and he got it back down uh, and, and got it through the, through the re-entry phase and into the glide phase. The only problem was he landed in Libya. And 
serious. And, and Richard and I knew that, God, hell, if, if John Cripp landed it in Libya, we knew damn well we weren't going to get to fly it because they wouldn't give it back to us. So we were, we were motivated to try and figure out how to control where you landed the thing when you came back in. And the guidance coming on the entry, uh, we, we played the what-if games on that entry. Uh, we were really ready if, if guidance didn't come through because I remember we, we shot practice approaches, John, God, to every dry lake bed west of the, west of the, uh, what's the river out here in West Texas? Uh, I don't know, anyway, and some of them on this side of that river too. But uh, some space spin off to that too. Uh, in the course of doing all that, I found some really good hunting and fishing areas out there in the Southwest <laughs> country. So that, that paid off too. The, the program, in all seriousness, was really an exciting and a terribly rewarding, uh, professionally rewarding experience and thing to get to be part of. Um, it, was, it was just a very, very proud moment for me and to have worked with not only these people up here, but with all of you out in the audience and all who aren't here today who made STS-1 happen. And it's an opportunity for me to, to thank you guys on the stage for making STS-1 happen and let me and thank you all for letting me be part of the program too. Um, I, uh, it, it, was a, it was a tremendous experience. It's something that we'll all remember and we'll all be proud of. And uh, I certainly won't ever forget any part of it. Thank you very much. John, I'm gonna let you go ahead and finish up. Now, no, I'll let Hal introduce you first because nobody knows who you are. Anyway. Uh, Thank you, Joe. I've been sitting over here nervous as a cat looking at this box <laughs> that I know they would not let John in an airport with. <laughs> and he's been sitting on this stage all afternoon. You know, it's really an awful task to have to give a short introduction to someone like John Young. One is tempted to call him the astronaut with the firstest and the mostest because he's got the mostest firstests and the most too. The first Gemini flight, Gemini 3, John flew the first solo flight in lunar orbit on Apollo 10. Obviously, he flew the first shuttle flight. He was also the commander of the first space lab flight. He is the astronaut with the most flights. In fact, he is the world's most experienced space flyer with six flights, the longest space flight career beginning with his 1965 Gemini mission and continuing through today. It brings up a question. The space shuttle main engines generate at full power an energy output in watts equal to 23 Hoover dams. That's just the SSMEs. If you add the solid rocket boosters, the total thrust generated at launch is about six and a half million pounds. Why would a man with all this experience strap one of those on his backside <laughs> It had never flown in an unmanned flight, please recall with us. The space shuttle made its first orbital flight with men on board. That's confidence and that's faith. And the faith was well placed and it was placed there by the commander, John Young. Well, would you, would you like to hear about STS-1 or would you rather hear uh, Joe Henry and Dick Truly's stories? I can tell those <laughs> all afternoon long. And they are just funny as a crutch. Joe Henry and Dick really did invent the transatlantic abort and if you shape it right, you can get a couple of 3,000 pounds of extra payload in orbit because of it. So it's more than just saving your engines out. I'll show you what this is in a minute. I brought my notes. I'd like to see the hands of everybody who's out there today who did get to work on STS-1. That's great. So we're up here telling you how we did it, and you, and you probably know meetings, <laughs> reviews, design, and hard work, and years and years and years of hard work. And of course, that orbiter was underfunded a little. I said the other day, Aaron used to know when we had to lay off people in July and Ham back in October so we could build it. 
Chris took a hit or two at the Augustine Committee, but I want to say uh, what the Augustine Committee said that probably George Lowe, if he were there, had wrote the paragraph for him. He said how to do it right. He listed five things that make the good old space program work. Redundant and flexible designs, explicit test procedures, independent checks and balances, and unwavering discipline. Very important. But above all, the fifth one, inquisitive, penetrating, and challenging people, people who are not satisfied to fill those squares of regulations, but rather are continually questioning and ferreting out anomalies to be placed in full view of all concern. Well, heck, needless to say, without those kind of people, those first four things, they just never happen. And where do we find those kind of people? Where in the dickens are they in this world today? Well, I think the people out in the audience know those kind of people because you are them. All the accomplishments of this incredible national program are thanks to you. And there are many, many accomplishments. If you hadn't done your jobs right, without what you've done, Crip and I and all the other 120 people who've flown a space shuttle wouldn't be here today. And that's a great quote. And there's another quote from the Augustine Committee that I kind of like, and I don't know who, who said it, but somebody beside them probably did, said, quote, if people stop taking chances, nothing great will ever be accomplished. Now, when Captain Crippen and I got to ride the Columbia, we were all in that machine together with each and every one of you out in that audience because you, we knew that you had taken a lot of chances. You'd had to make, and the people up here in this podium too, had taken a lot of chances. They had to make the hard engineering and management choices on everything, including the test programs. You had to answer as best you could really tough questions. Was that a good design? Could we do it for the money we had, which wasn't very much? I saw we could have saved shade four tons off the orbiter if we'd have willed spend 300 percent more. Was that software really going to work? 400 times a second, computers are going to talk to each other and make that baby fly? Will that really work? And do those old main engines really have to run that hot? And how about those tiles? We're going to have to redo those tiles to make them stick on, aren't we? And will we ever get all that paper closed out? When we started, people were glad that the first shuttle could carry 32,000 pounds to orbit because they thought it was going to have to be unclosed paper. <laughs> and you had to make thousands of other important things were done right because of your efforts and all the other folks at Marshall and Johnson and Stennis and the Cape. And because of that, Captain and Cripp and I had the best first flight, if you leave out Orville and Wilbur, in the history of test flying. And for that, we thank you. Now, this machinery right here is something that uh, we received up at the Air and Space Museum just the other day. And it's hard to see from where you are, but it is a very beautiful trophy. This thing on top it looks like a, a stained glass bowling, stained glass golf ball, but it is not. If you look down into it, you can see the launch of the space shuttle and there's another space shuttle on top of it going off. It's a gorgeous thing, and this Columbia tag has actually gone to the moon. Not gone to the moon, but flown on Columbia. Oh, well. <laughs> I'm already talking about future programs. But it is a great honor to receive this, but because each and every one of you out there at the Johnson Space Center was deeply involved in this thing, and because you're a piece of us riding on that mission, this trophy really belongs to you. And what I'd like to do is present it, this trophy to the Johnson Space Center. We'll put it out somewhere you can see it in some foyer, like over in Building One, where you have to come over to get in trouble every once in a while. And we'll stick it where everybody can see it because this trophy belongs to you. It's yours, you earned it, and you sure deserve it. And I want to sit it over here. And the Captain Crippen can't be here today. He's at the Fly Readiness Review, of course. But he wanted me to thank you all for your contributions in making this remarkable
flying machine work. And as has been said by our people up here, it's more than just transportation to space. With the payloads and the people we have up there, we're making progress, real progress in science and engineering and making advances in new technology to the benefit of the best outfit on this planet, the United States of America, and its people, and those people are us. And what we're doing is like this badge says, just the beginning. So one of these days, everybody in that audience will get thanked by the people who really count, your children and your grandchildren. Because of the contributions you're making in these advances, the world of tomorrow will be a better place for them. Until then, I want to thank you on behalf of the panel members for all your contributions and keep up the work because it's going to be even more important to do it in the future. Thanks for listening. Thank you, John. John may be a little unclear exactly where they went in Columbia, but <laughs> they got it back to the right spot. <laughs> How many of you out there do have a question you'd like to ask of this panel? Could I see a showing of hands? How many questions we might have? If we have a lot, I would be willing to take some now. If not, let me turn to the panel and ask, um, over the years, there have been misunderstandings or lack of understanding, perhaps, about what the shuttle really is and what the program is about. I noted in my, uh, in my review for this meeting today a, an article that appeared in the Washington Monthly exactly one year before that first flight, in 1980, uh, April. This quote, the Columbia has yet to fly. And I have to tell you, gentlemen, it was not really a, a, a very complimentary article. It said it's several years behind schedule with no imminent prospect, despite official assurances, that it will fly at all. But more important, if it does fly, it won't do anything those old throwaway rockets couldn't do. You've probably heard, for instance, that the space shuttle will retrieve damaged satellites and return them to Earth for repair. Not so, says the article. It can't. Simply and flatly can't. Would you react to the <laughs> Could you react to the statement that the space shuttle can't do what it was proposed to do? Not just the case of, well, Joe, you could talk about that on your flight alone. How about your reaction to some of the naysayers that we've heard over the years about the space shuttle and what it can do? Well, I, I think it's great to hear. It's refreshing to me to hear that because it's uh, kind of an incentive to keep, uh, keep pressing on maybe a little harder. I think people said you can't, say, can't do something uh, for as long as uh, any of us can remember. Um, I think that, uh, and I think that there are people who really have some very honest reservations about some of the objectives and some of the goals that we have when we set out to do things like this. But I think that is healthy in its way. It makes me feel good. It makes me realize that we're setting goals that, that are worth really going after and reaching for. And I think, uh, in fact, it was about a year ago, I rode on an airplane um, uh, out, to, uh, out west with a gentleman <clears throat> from one of the uh, from, in fact, one of our centers in the east, and he said that, uh, that the, uh, the X-30 will never fly. They'll never get the materials problem solved. They'll never be able to make materials that, that you'll be able to accelerate uh, through the atmosphere and fly into space. And today we've got them, fabricating them, and are ready to go. And I think it's a, it's, it, I enjoy it. I really enjoy th stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think uh, when, uh, if I go back in history a little bit, I think uh, Neil Armstrong might have said it good when he, uh, uh, when he was testifying before Congress or hearing before Congress after Apollo 11, he said that uh, we uh, tend to uh, overemphasize the things close in when we project ahead, but we don't do enough about what's going to happen in the in the future. And I think that's probably, I think that was probably that. I think we did accomplish a lot with the shuttle. I mean, if you just look at the statistics we have, it is a, a fantastic machine in terms of payload into orbit. It is a fantastic machine in man-machine relationships as proved by STS-37, uh, uh, the Solar Max mission. Uh, we've got a fantastic mission coming up uh, on the Intelsat reboost. Uh, so I do think it's proved its worth, and uh, I tend to agree with Joe. It's, uh, I think it's very gratifying to see what we did do and see what it has accomplished. And I, I think it, 
it will do a lot more in the future when we start uh, develop, uh, deploying the uh, space station systems. Well, Hal, also, I think um, the point I was trying to make, I think one way you can find some answers, and I'd like to make two comments on your question of reading that sort of thing in the paper. Again, I think all of us have been around long enough that you have to read the specifics in any news article with a certain amount of caution. Uh, you can certainly, by reading the papers, determine that there is a space shuttle. <laughs> but you have to be cautious taking it much farther than that. <laughs> and then secondly, you can begin to get some pretty good feeling by asking yourself, suppose as a nation we didn't have a space shuttle. And you find a pretty significant void. Uh, yes, you could take... Uh, uh, big dumb boosters and, and, and throw mass to orbit. But mass in orbit alone is not the answer. You know, cost per pound is a nice parameter, but it's really not the answer to the maiden's prayer. You can't take cost per pound and drive it to the minimum and, and decide you've gotten the right thing. So I think if you just stop and think, the basic decision in 68 and 69 was to begin to give ourselves the tools, if you would, to do something in this low Earth orbit near the Earth that Frankly, we're still just getting started on. So uh, ask yourself what, where we would be today if we hadn't decided to build a versatile vehicle like the shuttle. And frankly, the things it's done up to now is just preparing itself for the things it's really going to do. Uh, with respect to the specific erroneous allegation, we have a number of times brought satellites home. Uh, LDEF is the biggest one I think we ever brought home. We had some commsats that were not deployable. We brought back, and not only that, but we refurbished them and we relaunched them. And there was one other one uh, that I can recall. Solar Max. Was Solar, Solar Max. Solar Max. So I don't know where he got that stuff. As a matter of fact, as far as I'm concerned, the shuttle has demonstrated every performance capability it was supposed to have, to have had. Now maybe we're a little short on on weight into orbit, but you know we put some margins on over and above what we used to have. Well, I can also show you a newspaper article that said the jet engine would never be practical. That's right. For airplanes. So you can read all sorts of stuff in those kind of articles. The lesson is that the pundits are not always correct and that the proof is really in the pudding. How about they're it? always incorrect? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps so. You gentlemen have other recollections. I'm, I'm sure the people here today would enjoy your recollections of some of the little trials and tribulations along the way that. Uh, well, I would like, uh, I think Chris had the most profound statement, and I, it was in our roundup, but I would think for the people who didn't read the roundup article, uh, I think Chris's statement after we were, I thought it was when we were about ready to land or when we landed, he said we're infinitely smarter today. He might reflect on that because I think that was probably one of the most profound statements uh, that went into it. I, I'll, I'll remember that uh, for a long period. I made that statement talking to ourselves as well as to our critics. I, I, I don't think that we all uh, had a hundred percent belief that everything we had done was going to uh, come out as well as we thought it would. We, I, I visualized some changes, but we had an awful lot of criticism from people that uh, said the software wouldn't work. Uh, a, a lot of people said that the tile base was weak and we were going to have fatigue failures and etc. And so it was to those critics that we were all speaking that uh, we were pretty dumb the day before, but we were certainly pretty smart the day we landed. And uh, so I, it was a very gratifying day. I think that I don't see how it could have been any greater for any of us sitting on this stage or those that sit in the audience. Uh, the thing I, the point I was trying to make uh, along with what Bob said there is it seems to me we have a tendency to uh, forget history. Uh, we, we don't read history. We don't benefit from the experiences that we had uh, all along in the space program, and we should. Uh, I was going to say that it, when I was taught the Bible, uh, if you didn't read the history that surrounded the events that take place in the Bible, you have a hard, very hard time understanding what, what, they, what they mean. And so if you don't read the problems that existed in the space program all along during that period, you really can't appreciate uh, the problems that we had, the solutions to those problems, and why 
we were doing the things that we did. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things I was going to do was ask the audience, how many in the audience have read This New Ocean? Is there a show of hands there? I recommend you read it. <laughs> it's the history of Project Mercury, and you'll find that all of the uh, uh, political decisions, all of the uh, um, problems that we faced uh, in management and budget and congressionally and, and, and technically are all a, a lesson to be learned. Uh, John Logston wrote a book called The Decision to Go to the Moon, which is a fantastic book uh, that deals with the issues of the day of how that decision got made. It, it, you know, it, it, I used to say that uh, if, in, as a matter of fact, I was worried recently by Bromfield making a speech at the, at the uh, Goddard dinner. I understand that he praised NASA and said that we were doing the right things. He's the first advisor to the science advisor to the president that ever agreed with anything we ever did. And I always felt like if that guy said we, we shouldn't do it, it was probably the best thing, possible thing we could do. <laughs> so you, you have to, in my opinion, you really need to understand all of this historical background because it will help you understand what's going on today and, and probably give you a little more insight into how to handle the problems you've got and not become so uh, upset about it and, and know that, it, that you will come out through the other end pretty well. I think, Chris, to pick up on that point, uh, we're in the process now of just coming out of a restructuring activity on the space station. We had a restructuring activity on shuttle. If you'll think about the vehicle we entered phase B with, the two-stage, fully reusable, the concept that if you used everything, it would be cheaper and better to operate. Then we came out the other end after a restructuring with a fairly different vehicle. We decided that maybe using every, reusing everything wasn't the best way to approach it, at least in the time period that we were facing. We were facing some very heavy budget pressures. Again, the, the attitude within the halls of Congress was, number one, they wanted a manned space flight program, but they didn't want one at 4% of the federal budget. They wanted one at 1% 1 of the federal budget. And so you had to sort out doing the right thing technically in the presence of these pressures. And I think a very successful vehicle can come out of restructuring. A very successful vehicle can come out of budget pressures. But you have to make sure you don't let the budget pressures cause you to do something dumb or cause you to do something that will not work or will not be effective. So the, the class of problems we have today are really no, no more difficult or no easier than the ones we had 10, 20, 30 years ago. And I think Chris's point is a good one. I think if we will reflect on these things that happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago, put ourselves in perspective today, We've got a pretty good set of problems today. Let's have a good time and go fix them and be on with it. And the critics of the shuttle are not well thought critics. I have not seen the first article in 10 years that I thought was a well thought criticism of the shuttle. No in-depth ana analysis, no in-depth reasoning, no explanations of what the alternatives might have been if we hadn't built it. It's all very superficial and the sort of thing you just sort of have to let roll off your back and keep going. If the public misunderstands or does not understand the real role of the shuttle, um, is that injurious to the future of space flight, to manned space flight? Well, it certainly could be, but it isn't uh, catastrophic. I think that uh, a lot of the people that are within the, uh, within the government, for example, I'm encouraged every now and then after those of us involved in more details and more engineering, we argued whether it ought to be life science or material science or this or that. Uh, someone with a little wisdom says, hey, it's, it's no one of those things, no single of those things. We're doing it because it's just the right thing to do. And that gives you a pretty encouraging feeling every now and then. A, gentle, a gentleman that uh, uh, preceded you in the job you had taught me once. Uh, he said, if you, if you uh, bat 500 with the press, You've done pretty well. And I, uh, although we all, we, we're all criticized the press, we don't like the press for what they say about us, but we, aren't, we are here because of the press. Uh, they made us what we are. They, they built us up and they tore us down. And uh, the NASA bashing that you have today is a result of the fact that they're the ones that made us so high on the pinnacle in the first place. So you have to be somewhat philosophical about 
the press. The press is there, uh, whether we like it or not, and we must do as good a job as we can in telling them what we are doing and how we are going about it. Whether they get it right or not, we have to keep trying because uh, they are our eyes and ears and voice to the public, whether we, whether we like it or not. So I come back to, to Shorty Power's tutelage. They're very important and very constructive overall part of our society, and you have to have to learn to deal with it and have to use it effectively. I'd like to ask uh, John, uh, John Yardley, what, uh, what was on your, uh, what was the biggest uh, concern you had uh, getting ready to fly? Uh, I know I give you a lot of problems. Then, I know I give you a lot of problems as the orbital project manager. It, but, uh, it was then, <laughs> and it is now, and that's the uh, space shuttle main engine. Uh, it's a, it's worked flawlessly, but of course you know we went through a lot of problems. Uh, we had a lot of explosions. We fixed everything, but it's still one whale of a lot of energy in a small barrel every time. It's got to work right, so it takes a lot of tender loving care all the time. Well, also, uh, I often say, particularly when I'm talking to a, a lay group, a, a hydrogen oxygen rocket engine like the one in the shuttle is like building an extremely hot fire in a cardboard box. You have to build it very carefully, and you have to keep it from burning up the box. And if you don't manage everything just right inside, if you don't get the cooling going where it's supposed to go, if you don't keep the mixture ratios where it's going properly, you let the bearings give a little problem or you let a crack turbine blade. So anyone who doesn't worry about the performance of a rocket engine while you're launching doesn't understand what goes on inside of a rocket engine. Now, a pressure turbine, just a little bigger than a uh, Volkswagen engine, uh, but instead of 65 horsepower, it puts out 65,000 horsepower. You put it in your Volkswagen and start, you could end up on Mars. <laughs> There's three of those. We got three of those. So, you know, again, people, people get used to looking at their television and seeing a four and a half million pound vehicle get up off of a launch pad and in eight minutes accelerate to 17, 18,000 miles an hour and end up right in space where it's supposed to go in order to fly very fast around the earth. And we get sort of routine about it. But you know, that, that's, that's the lesson of, of Challenger, in my opinion. You see, uh, what happened, it, it, the strange, I, I've said this before, and some of the audience have heard me say it before, but the, the, I tried to think about Challenger. Why did Challenger happen to us? Why, what, what caused that to happen? And the best thing that I said to myself was that most of us sitting on this stage uh, had grew, grew to what we had through failure. I mean, everything we had ever done in our lives resulted many times in failure. And so every time we did anything in our decision-making process, we thought failure. What, the damn thing's going to fail. What can we do to prevent it from failing? And I think that that sort of got buried after a while, and everybody started thinking success. And if, when you start thinking success, then you say, well, yeah, it's got this wrong with it, but it'll work because it worked before and, and so you start making decisions that way and that's what gets you in trouble so you sort of you have to go back to square one every once in a while and recognize these damn things are going to fail and that's what john's talking about with the ssme well, on, on the, the rocket of course we had ample warning of that blow by that nobody was, was worrying about it in the old days you know you would want to have once you'd either fix it quick or stop all the flights Amen. until you did. Amen. And that, that's, the, that's the appalling thing to yeah. me about it, John, is that you could, that here you had all these telltale signs of blow-by, and you let the thing continue to fly. Nine cases. And, and that just, uh, it, that's the reason I said what I did about Mercury. You can't ignore it, these it, things. You, you cannot. When, that, when those <laughs> flags raise up, then you've got to go fix them. The other side of the coin is, however, that you don't fix things by procedure. You don't th fix things by having 17 people sign off on something and therefore leave a yellow beam yeah. in the back end of an orbiter because, you, <laughs> because 17 people said it was out of there. The first guy said, well, the 17th guy will catch it. The 17th guy said, my God, Malin 16 of them must have certainly taken that beam out of there. 
And, and uh, if, you, if you read about total quality management and the guy that invented total quality manager, and, and he Deming, and he goes to look at, at, a, at a company that has all his quality control, the first thing he does is fire all of the quality control people and hire back one. And that's a fact. So you, you can't let this thing get to you uh, by saying, well, I've proceduralized the damn thing into safety. That's the worst possible thing you can do. Well, Aaron, you're, you sit today. <laughs> you sit today in a very prominent position in the management chain of the space shuttle. Give us your, give us your view of how NASA as an agency, as an organization, as a process has responded to that challenge and how well we're doing in returning safely to flight. Well, I think, uh, you know, I go back to, uh, to uh, the process we've always used, at, uh, at least when I grew up in the manned spaceflight business, is that you uh, pay attention to detail, and uh, you have a management system that uh, causes your people or gives your people the feeling that you want to hear what problems they, they see and have. And then uh, you take that and you go off and you solve your problems in a very uh, deliberate fashion. That doesn't say you can always solve your problems the way everybody wants you to solve them, but you do uh, address them and you do uh, then tell people what you have did about their problems. And I think we've done that. I think we do have a, 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 a system that uh, is back to the basics. Uh, I think we do have people paying attention to detail. Uh, I think we've demonstrated that. So I think, and I think we have a process, a check and balance process that is back to where we were, and I feel very good about it. I think uh, we can achieve a, a, a very good flight rate, uh, a very uh, adequate flight rate that we have to do. I think we will have a flight rate that will uh, allow us to uh, support the space station development and uh, fly the payloads we have to fly. I, we are working. Uh, we are working to see what we can do to uh, reduce the, uh, the cost of the shuttle, the operations cost of the shuttle. I think we need to do that. But when I look back and see where we started, when I look back and reflect on STS-1 or prior to STS-1, the, uh, the uh, nine years or so before STS-1, uh, and see where we are today, I guess I'm very gratified uh, where we are in terms of where we are. And I do think that John or even on that button uh, that we people have, I don't have one on, but the button says we're just begin. It's just beginning, and I think that's a very true statement. It is just beginning, and I think shuttle's got a long, a long uh, history, a long capability in the future to uh, to go forward with that. So I feel very good about it. I'd like to hear what the, what the John John has to say about that. Well, I I kind of disagree with uh, John. What John Yardley says twenty years from now, I think the shuttle. Uh, because of the uh, ability of everybody in the audience and all the people listening at, at Marshall and Kennedy and, and headquarters and Stennis to have the brains and the fortitude to do it right, that the space shuttles will still be go for launch in 2020. I really believe that. And uh, furthermore, I think when you have good outfits like we got here around here at NASA, we have the ability to do these other programs we have the ability to do them well, rapidly, and fast, and we ought to do that. Because the purpose of the NASA goal is the number one bullet, is to enhance human knowledge of the atmosphere and of the phenomena of the, uh, of the Earth and the space and, and the atmosphere. And uh, now that we know that space goes all the way out to the edge of the universe, we got a big job. <laughs> but I can't think of a better bunch of people more qualified to do it, and I say, let's get on with it. I'd like to say I'm not. I'd like to start out by first saying this is not a criticism of what's going on today. I don't want to make it sound like that, but I, I'd like to point out that NASA, whether you like it or not, is changing. NASA is a very different place today than it was 10 years ago, certainly 25 years ago, and that's, I, that, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But the challenges to NASA today are very different. They're about therefore. And so, in my opinion, 
It, we need to be as innovative in management te technique and style as we tend to be in technology and solving problems because it is an equal challenge to the technology. And so the, the, the use of the shuttle in the future, the way in which we conduct space programs must be looked at in an innovative form rather than trying to stay with the same thing we've done in the past. You, you just can't stay with the status quo, keep the cost down, keep things going ahead, and make progress because NASA needs to do things differently because it is a different agency. So I say the real challenge of today is to get with it. Do something innovative in every field, finance, budget, management, and show that NASA can grip, come to grips with these problems and, and, and take the criticism that we have and do something about it. Very good. With that, let's give our audience an opportunity to ask some questions of this panel for just a few moments. Uh, raise your hand, please. If you have a question, we'll send a, a microphone to you. Is there a question over here? The gentleman over here has a question. Uh, to John Young, on your first flight, were there any surprises on that first mission once you got up on orbit that uh, you hadn't encountered or through launch? Well, when we opened the payload bay doors, we looked out and saw the tiles missing off the own pod. <laughs> <laughs> that, that surprised me. But I tell you, the real, <laughs> the real surprise of that mission was just that uh, after all the troubles that we'd planned for and worked for, double and triple failures in the simulator and the people at Mission Control know all the things that we went through, that the vehicle just worked so beautiful in the end. It really did. It was incredible how well, starting into orbit, it went right into orbit. It, the payload bay doors opened and we'd practice all these things where they wouldn't open. We'd have to use EVA to close them and go out and repair tiles and all the cr uh, strange things in the entry. Just beautiful, just right down the pipe. You could just lay your finger on top of where the LO lift to drag ratio was and you knew that the vehicle was right on, that we wasn't going to land in Las Vegas, we are going to land at Edwards. <laughs> Joe Henry and Dick had landed in Las Vegas, they'd probably, <laughs> they'd probably still be there. But it was just beautiful in and it was a perfect flight, and it was just great, and, and thanks to a lot of people that are right here in this room, and I think it was fantastic. That was, only, that was my real surprise, that it worked so well, and when I went around the vehicle after it got on the ground, uh, people said, we saw you out there kicking the tiles, tires. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You don't, you don't kick tiles on the orbiter. <laughs> they were all on the bottom. And I know John Yardley is well for me with all the meetings that we sat in, hundreds of them or thousands of them, where it said statistical, improbable, that you weren't going to lose a tile off the vehicle in a very important place. And we didn't lose a single one, not one. Just gorgeous. What a machine. Temperature outside, 2,000 to 2,500 degrees inside, 68. It's cold. <laughs> Can't beat it. Another question down here, please. I'll have to apologize to start. This might be the result of reading some history and not all of it. Um, I'd like some administrative perspective on the fact that in the development of the shuttle in the mid-60s, there was one, one of the front runners of the designs was the Lockheed Star Clipper, which was essentially an orbiter with a drop tank. And then as the, essentially the winds started to move in that we would be able to develop a shuttle, it grew into this massive flyback booster configuration, which then Congress came back and said you couldn't have, and you had to go back to an orbiter with a drop tank. And then space station, once the shuttle started flying, we had Space Operations Center in like 79. Marshall had some designs of essentially smaller configurations for station, but then the winds started to arrive that we were going to get an approval for a space station. And first it grew one keel, then it grew two keels, and now we're having to have it cut back again to essentially very close to what the original Space Operations Center was. Who didn't read the history? Um, how about? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't a question. Let our historians tell about it. Yeah, let, 
<laughs> Let me comment on that. I Who think I think I can uh, comment on the gist of the question. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm often uh, surprised and then amused. Uh, when I talk to different groups from time to time as to who invented what and who decided we'd do this or who decided we would leave to that or whose version of a vehicle was finally the winning version. And in my experience, the vehicles that emerge in this country are a composite of so many different inputs, it's virtually impossible to determine who the particular inventor or who the particular idea uh, really should be attributed to, and I think, frankly, that's one of the strengths we have in this country. Uh, there's always a certain criticism of moving slow, but I think there's certain virtues of moving slow. By the time you start with a general thought of what you'd like to accomplish, phase A in a program, time you come out phase B, which is generally two or three years later, lots of different factors have influence why you're going in certain directions and why you should build vehicles a certain way. Then every so often, about once every 10 or 15 years in today's world, you get to then solidify things and go forward and build something. In the case of the space shuttle, the phase A studies had been accomplished in the late 60s, and the phase B started in 1970. And at that time, you actually select contractors, and then it's a combination of the contractors and the government trying to then evolve into something that you literally feel you can go build. You can go get the funding out of the Congress. It technically has enough of a reasonable kind of problems you can solve them. And one of the stories I often tell the people who argue for building a vehicle a different way is you never really know the answers to but one way. You get to go down only one path. And so a vehicle like the shuttle could have been built several different ways. Space station can be built several different ways. But as a nation, you can only afford to go one way. And I think the, uh, I would have a very difficult time trying to tell you who the designer of the shuttle was. And I'd have a very difficult design, time trying to tell you who the designer of the space station was. It's an evolutionary activity that comes out of many, many different places. So you have to read a lot of history, and then you have to have many different people interpret it, and you'll never know the real answers. Yeah, I think that's... Bob, that's damn good, and I think a lot of times, too, you know, we looking back in history and say, God, why didn't we use this idea or that idea? When we have the luxury of doing that and using all these great ideas that people all over the country come up, we don't always take the best idea of everybody to build a vehicle, but we seem to have always taken the ideas of everybody to build the best vehicle, and that, that I think sometimes we're guilty of overlooking, that, that the best overall design isn't necessarily uh, pieces that we've put together and patched together. We sometimes have to make it work to the end product. Any design is ultimately a set of reasonable compromises or decisions. And the way a vehicle gets designed is you generally get a small nucleus of people and put them in a responsible organization somewhere and make them make those decisions on a timely basis. And when it's appropriate to make them, make them and move forward. But you'll never know but one set of answers. Another question out here, please. And if someone in the audience, uh, you know, asks about straight wings or canards or uh, gas generator engines or swing engines, uh, tell them they might have been right. No one really knows. <laughs> I'd like to know um, when you think I would be able to fly to the moon and to Mars, and how long would I need to do to make that happen? Well, I've been working on the synthesis group for the last... Uh, six to nine months. Um, if you will write the checks, we'll send you in the year 2018. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't see that in the cards. Uh, I think that uh, we will be a long time getting to Mars, in my opinion, because uh, there are a lot of uh, things that have to happen. A lot of things have to line up for that to happen besides the planets. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you just depended on the planets, you know, you could get there. Uh, the, uh, 2018 is a great year. Uh, you can go with both chemical and nuclear propulsion in that year, and uh, I'd be happy to be the flight director if you were the pilot. Uh, but I don't think that's going to happen that way. But I, th I think that there will be a great deal of 
uh, progress made towards uh, getting a, a good space program by that time period. Uh, I think most of us still feel the same way we did in, in Apollo. I, I remember that after Apollo 17, we all seemed to look at each other and say, we don't want to do that again until it's easy to do it again. And I, I don't think you want to go to Mars uh, uh, for the first time or back to the moon again until it is a lot easier than it was in Apollo. Apollo was a very risky mission. I think the probability of success in Apollo was in the neighborhood of 60 or 70 percent compared to the probability of success of a shuttle flight today and its whole mission being probably 0.99 and as many strings of nine as you want to put on it. So in my opinion, not, uh, uh, you may not have that many nines when you go to back to the moon and Mars the next time, but you want to be as damn close to it as you can get and make it a lot more reasonable operation than it was the first time we met. So I, I think it'll be probably quite some time, unfortunately, till we get there. Well, you'll also have to have a time when our society is willing to fund it and stick with it for many years. It's not something that's going to come easy, either in the funding arena or in the time arena. It's not going to happen with low investments and short periods of time. It's going to take long, steady investment. That's right, but so we're going to have to live with the kind of, of investment that, that, that is forthcoming. And we ought to take advantage of it in developing the kinds of technology that's going to really pay off for the space program. And in my opinion, that's around Earth. I think that the, every, everything we do in spaceflight ought to have the question attached to it. What does that do for us down here on Earth? Every space decision ought to be made that way. And I think if we made it that way, we would get there just as fast and maybe a little faster. I think the, uh, the issue is when is, a, is a, a tough one to come by has been addressed, but I think the uh, important issue is that it's inevitable it will be done. I think there's no question in my mind that uh, we will return to the moon, as President Bush said, and we'll return to stay, and I think we will send uh, uh, humans to, the, to Mars. Uh, I think the, uh, exactly the timetable, it's hard to determine because there are a lot of variables that are not really completely under our control right now. But I do think the, uh, the management of NASA feels that way, and I think uh, uh, the, the, uh, our uh, bosses feel that way. So I think our job is uh, we, we've got a very bright future in terms of the shuttle, of flying the shuttle, flying it safely, and uh, designing, developing, assembling, operating the space station, and the technologies that will allow us to do that. So to answer your question when is pretty hard, but to answer your question will it happen, I say yes, it will, it's inevitable, it will happen. And I believe that it ought to be, if you, could have your, if you could have your way, how critical it is in this great country, the best outfit on the planet, to make real rigorous and disciplined progress in advancing science and technology for our future, for our children and our grandchildren, how important that is. And that's what we're going to do when you do things like go back to the moon and on to Mars. You're going to learn something you didn't know before. There are going to be young people all over the country take those new ideas, make them into new ways of doing things, and you name it, down the line. You can't even imagine what all the things will do. New ways to do farming, alternate energy sources, all kinds of unimaginable improvements in medicine and technology. And we, and we ought to do that, in my opinion, just the way we did Apollo. Crash program, we'd learn a lot faster, we'd do it cheaper, and, and furthermore, we'd save the government so much money you, could, you couldn't haul it out of here in a wheelbarrow. I really believe it. And, and even more part of the fun would be having uh, young engineering people and scientists working on this thing, doing the kind of things that Aaron and Chris and, and Bob and John and I used to do back 20 years ago when you'd go to a meeting, and there wouldn't be but 10 or 12 people, and then they'd all be going like crazy because they were so busy. Of course, they had to miss their spouses and sweethearts for years at a time. But gosh, that was a lot of fun getting a job done like that. And part of, the, part of the importance of the program would be doing just such of a thing. Boy, that would be great. And wouldn't it be wonderful for this country and for our grandbabies? Wouldn't it? Well, you
Huh? You can have a grandbaby. We keep saying it. I got two of them. Yeah. <laughs> I only say that because I have two grandbabies already, and everybody in here used to be a grandbaby <laughs> themselves. And with that, let me thank our panel for being here today. John Yardley, Chris Kraft, Bob Thompson, Aaron Cohen, Joe Engel, and John Young. Thank you for your recollections of STS-1 and uh, your prognostications about the future of manned spaceflight. And thank you all for being here with us today. And this, that's fine. Okay, thank you.